The ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. So much of our wildlife and biodiversity on this planet lives and is dependent on the ocean. The ocean is extremely diverse from the whales to the plankton. Each species plays a unique role in their own ecosystem and Earth as a whole. There is one organism that plays a tremendously important role that connects the ecosystem together. This organism provides nourishment, sanctuary, and a breeding ground for much of the life in the ocean. That is the coral reef. My name is Will Grant, and I'm a professional BMX racer and permaculture enthusiast. I love to be outdoors. I love to try new things. I love to push myself mentally and physically. In BMX, there's real risk. If I make a mistake, I can break a bone. I can end up in the hospital. But in life, life tends to be a lot safer. There is serious consequences to not getting the jump correctly, and that brings your full awareness to the present moment. On top of that, it's outside. It's fun. There's moving. There's playing. There's a lot of um, friends involved where you can push yourself and each other. So I consider myself a permaculture enthusiast, and what permaculture is, is a type of living with the land in a way that is good for nature and that is good for people. With permaculture, we create systems that mirror what nature is already doing. So instead of working against nature, we see and observe what nature is already doing and find ways for that to work together as one living piece, one living ecosystem, one microbiome. Everything that we do on land runs off into the water. So whatever toxic chemicals I'm spraying on the land, you know, we know that that then drains downstream to the oceans. It's all connected. Growing up in Florida, I've had a much closer connection to the ocean and the beaches and the wildlife underwater than I, I guess most people had the opportunity to. Seeing the direct impact and the enjoyment that humans get from the ocean, you know, the enjoyment that humans get from the wildlife under the sea, that is a huge reason of why it sparked my interest to want to go down to the Keys and see and understand the health of the coral reefs firsthand. I want to learn how I can do better as an individual as well as do better as a community of how we can just do things in a better way that makes more sense for everyone and everything on this planet. One of the premier snorkeling spots in the world for marine life and coral reef is the Florida Keys. Going out into the water today, going snorkeling, wearing Key Largo. I feel like I'm always suiting up for something cool. Are you sure this goes this way?
The crew at Sailfish Scuba know some of the best spots out on the reef. Their crew walked me through what to do and what not to do in the water. Don't touch the corals, point out any trash, and be respectful of the wildlife and their habitat. Don't go down in the dark hole. Your reefs are gonna die down there. Don't use the trash can, we're not in hole. Like you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ready? yeah. Once you're out there, it's pretty obvious why millions of people travel to the Keys to snorkel, dive, and fish. It's gorgeous. The water is crystal clear and the sun on your skin just hits different. Snorkeling may seem simple, but take it from me, it's a little harder than it looks. But as soon as I jumped into the water, I felt as connected to the wildlife as I am to my bike on the track. One of the things that I learned, of course, is you cannot touch them. It is a passive observation in a way where you can swim all around them and really dive in deep but just w w without touching or tinkering with the coral reefs themselves. You know, the trash that is in the ocean, of course, if you're just swimming by it and it's floating, you can pick it up. Ironically, the pieces of trash that can sink down to the bottom, the corals will actually use that and create some sort of habitat in that as well. But if it's on the ground and connected or involved with the corals, you should actually tell them and then they actually go under there and inspect it to see if it's just laying there in the way or if it's actually a part of the coral. It was an absolutely wonderful experience to be under the water and to be swimming in between the corals, but it was also eye-opening to see the destruction and the degeneration firsthand. We can all understand the importance of the coral reef and why we need them, but what if they weren't there? What if we woke up one day and they were all gone? I got the opportunity to sit down with marine and water management experts to learn about the health and life of the coral reef. As I noted, the Florida Keys and the reefs here in Florida are a national treasure. We don't have anything like this anywhere else in the United States. This is the only barrier reef system we have. The coral reef in the Florida Keys is more than 350 miles long. It stretches from the dry tortugas at the far western point of the Keys to north of West Palm Beach near the St. Lucie Inlet. On land, that's more than 100 miles longer than the drive between New York City and Washington, D.C. So corals are animals. They're colonies. The individual coral animal is called a polyp, and thousands and thousands of these polyps are all interconnected to form what's called a colony. Talking to Dr. Bruckner was awesome. I could have talked to him for hours. When it comes to coral reef experts, he's near the top of the list. We know that you need corals to have healthy fish populations, to have healthy sea urchin, healthy lobster and all that. But you need those other animals on the reef to have a healthy community overall. They also provide things like we've discovered a lot of novel chemicals that, that we can extract from corals as well as other organisms found on the reef that have anti-cancer properties and other sort of medicinal values. In 1990, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, made the Florida Keys Coral Reef a national marine sanctuary. Anywhere you put your foot in the water in the Florida Keys, you're in a national marine sanctuary. Basically, that is provides protections for this national treasure because that's really what it is, is an area unlike anything we have anywhere else in the world. Sarah Fangman is the superintendent for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Is the sanctuary much like, kind of like a national forest where there's just a lot of regulations and protections to keep it natural and to keep it healthy? People definitely make that analogy with national marine sanctuaries, sort of they, oftentimes it's national parks that they compare us to because people just 
recreated national parks and they are, you know, recognized as valuable to our entire nation. And so we need to protect them, but we still want to encourage compatible use. We want to encourage people to come and enjoy these places. And people can fish in some places in the sanctuary. In fact, most places in the sanctuary. But we want to make sure that they do that in a way that is sustainable. Her work in the Keys helps to protect the delicate wildlife in the water, but also the economy the Keys has made a name on. What other roles do they play in the ecosystem or in our lives? Without question, fisheries. You like to eat fish? <laughs> yeah, I love it. All right, well, there's a lot of people that catch fish on these reefs. They support an abundance of fish. Um, so, and that in fact is the second largest economic driver here in the Keys is commercial fishing. And here in the Keys, you know, there, there are p areas that are considered sort of the world fishing capital. Being a national marine sanctuary brings a lot of much needed protections for the wildlife too. And how exactly do you protect them and keep them safe currently? You can't drill for oil in the sanctuary. You can't drop an anchor on the coral. You can't release um, untreated sewage in, like, out of your boat into the sanctuary. There's even areas that are set aside for research only. Corals aren't just pretty to look at. They also have a huge role to play in protecting people on land. Without those corals out there, the next storm that comes through is gonna be much more devastating because that reef, when it is healthy and when it is building, because that's what they do, they grow and they build. When they do that and a storm comes through, it diminishes the waves before they hit the land. A sponge can't do that. A lot like forests on land, the coral reefs are changing, whether we like it or not. What scientists are trying to narrow in on is why they're changing. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen firsthand in the reef? In the 1970s and early 1980s, most of the bottom in coral reef areas was covered by coral. So you'd have anywhere from 30 to 90% living coral cover. Today, when you go to reefs, it depends on where you go, but if you go to Florida or the wider Caribbean, in most locations, it's down to 5% or even less than that. Can you imagine a football field size piece of the reef? Under a healthy circumstance, you would expect that 35% or so of that football field would be live, healthy coral under a, you know normal circumstances. Today, on many of our reefs, that percentage, that football field would only have 2% coral cover. So these, these habitats are still very dynamic. They're still vibrant, they're colorful. So the tourists that come here still have a wonderful experience. They're just seeing a different assemblage, a different collection of organisms now than they would have if they came here in 1970, than they would have if they came here in 1950. Michael Jordan has lived in the Keys his entire life. Spending time out on the water is more than a job. It's his way of life. Do you remember snorkeling and viewing the corals as a kid? You had a lot more fish life than you have now. Mm -hmm. um, used to fish off these bridges down here and back in the 60s and 70s. You throw a line in the water and catch fish. Really? Now you gotta work at it. Tampa is pretty far from the Keys, but it's home to the Florida Aquarium. The biologists here, like Emily Williams, are on the cutting edge of coral restoration. Without their research, the reef as we know it could disappear, and with it, an entire way of life. People come to Florida for the beautiful beaches, for the fishing, for the diving, for the snorkeling. And without our coral reefs, there's nothing to see. There's nothing to see when you go snorkeling. There's no one that's going to come dive on just a pile of rocks. Um, and that's where we're headed. Without living corals on our reefs, the ecosystem will collapse. It's actually really heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. Like it's hard not to cry thinking about it, yeah. just going out on the reefs, especially after diving around the rest of the Caribbean. They have really healthy coral reefs and then coming back to Florida and seeing the damage that's been done from habitat destruction to this new stony coral tissue loss disease, it's, it's really heartbreaking. So without systemic change, 
our work really can't take hold. But how do you know a coral is struggling? What does it look like? First signs of stress in coral is for them to bleach, which is when they expel those zooxanthellae and you can see their white skeleton through their tissue. So that's why they look white when they're bleached. The reason why we call it bleaching is because corals are normally yellows, browns, or greens. That color comes from these single-celled algae that live within their tissues. It's all just like a, a leaves of a tree are green. They're green because they have chlorophyll. Well, these cells have the same thing. They have chlorophyll and some of these other pigments that are important for photosynthesis. When the coral expels them, the coral tissue itself is actually translucent, it's clear. And so when the coral bleaches, it can still be alive initially. And what you're seeing is the underlying skeleton. It's stark white because that skeleton is white. But if that coral bleaches and the temperature stress is goes on for too long, they will ultimately starve to death and start dying. There's many things that can cause coral bleaching, but the main thing that's causing sort of large scale, either regional or global level bleaching is temperature stress in combination with elevated ultraviolet radiation, too much light. Too much light, what is the too much light coming from? It's just penetration of ultraviolet radiation into the water is not necessarily good for the corals. And what temperature is the, you know, the sweet spot that corals really like and where are we at now? A lot of these areas would drop to maybe 24 degrees Celsius. In Florida, it's a little colder because we're sort of a, a subtropical region and it can drop down to about 16, which I think is like 70 degrees or something like that. In terms of warm water, typically corals don't like temperatures in this, in this area above about 30 degrees Celsius. If it goes much hotter than that, it depends on how much hotter and how long that persists. They can start bleaching within a week of temperature that's only one degree Celsius higher than their normal annual maximum temperature. Corals are kind of like Goldilocks. They like the water to be just the right temperature. Too hot's no good, too cold's no good. Getting the opportunity to hold the coral reef in my hand really enlightened me on the fragility of the coral reefs. If I were to drop that piece that I held in my hand, it would have shattered into a million pieces. It was almost like these tiny little pores on the surface of it that I imagine in an event like dredging that would cover it would definitely suffocate this animal. Restoring the corals can't be done overnight. There's a lot that goes into it. Uh, we were the first in the world to be able to reproduce Atlantic corals in a lab environment. What we want to do is we want to restore certain critical locations where the corals we put on those reefs, once they grow large enough and reproduce, they'll produce offspring that can settle on some of these other reefs. So we expand our effort. That's sort of the first thing. The second thing is, we know that we can't just throw a few corals out and hope they live because there's a lot of other stressors out there that are affecting them. Just like humans, there's a lot of different genetic variation, you know, so every person looks a little different. We have different traits, different genetic traits. Well, corals are exactly the same way. Certain strains, for instance, are more tolerant of high temperatures. Certain ones are tolerant of diseases. Despite their best efforts, time is running out to repopulate the Florida reef. Think of the coral in Florida as an endangered species. There just aren't enough left. And we've been going back to monitor them and they are growing, but there just aren't enough other colonies out there for them to reproduce. So without a sustainable wild population, we can't just keep putting out new genotypes. It's a similar problem that scientists face with the Florida panther, where they didn't have very many individuals left and it got to the point where they had to bring in a, a different subspecies in to breed with the local population. Climate change in general is probably the largest global stress to coral reefs overall. Animals like humans get diseases, and there has been a, a really massive, unprecedented disease outbreak that has been running through our reef track. Something called stony coral tissue loss disease um, that originated in Miami. It's something that first started in 2014, and it's still going strong. It's basically spread throughout the entire Florida reef track I would say for decades, our corals have been declining, but in the last five years, that decline has increased because of this disease. And this is unlike any other coral disease that's been seen on any reef anywhere around the world. 
you'll see like a brain coral and you'll see an outline where it's just bleaching it out because yeah. uh, it's killing the coral. They even developed a um, antibiotic for it. Oh, wow. And they tried uh, running around the outside edge of it to protect the rest of the coral and mm -hmm. they're working on different aspects to try to salvage the yeah. coral and fight this disease. Water quality and pollution, I think, is the biggest factor for our reefs right now. And what is hurting the water quality? Runoff from anything from like roads that when it rains, it all washes into the ocean, from agriculture runoff, everything goes to the ocean. All drains lead to the ocean. While in Tampa, we stopped and spoke to marine scientist, Dr. Brian Barnes. He spends a lot of his time up close and personal with the coral, studying their health and growth. Using satellite imagery, he was able to determine the coral reefs were in bad shape. This caught the eye of NOAA scientists too. The, the, the Panama Canal had a deepening and widening. Um, they, they added a new channel so that they could fit larger ships to come through. And when they added the new canal, that meant you know the larger ships coming through, they have to have somewhere to go to deliver their cargo. So all up and, up and down the eastern seaboard of the U.S., they made deeper and wider. They made the ports deeper and wider in order to accommodate these bigger ships. Kind of like turning a dirt road into a big highway. That, yes, that's the general idea. Dr. Barnes linked up with Miami Waterkeeper, a nonprofit dedicated to protecting South Florida's water and marine life. Their goal was to determine the cause of the widespread disease to the coral along the coastline of Miami. We don't know for sure, but it does seem like this massive coral disease that broke out starting in 2014 seems to have started right next to where um, they were dredging at the port of Miami. We don't know for sure yet that they're connected, but it does seem suspicious in space and time that they happen in the same place at the same time. After we actually learned about um, a major port dredging projects going on to expand the port of Miami that was illegally burying our corals. Florida especially has a really shallow continental shelf, so um, it's not deep enough in a lot of places for large cargo ships and cruise ships and things to come into places like Biscayne Bay in Miami that's uh, relatively shallow. It was determined that the Port of Miami needed to deepen and widen the shipping channel that was built to make way for these supersized shipping vessels that they're also expanding the Panama Canal for. What exactly is dredging and you know how is that impacting the coral? In this case there's a bunch of different ways that you can do dredging but in this case there was basically what looks like a giant egg beater with spikes on the end of a large ship and they cut through um, the ground under the water and then they suction the the water mixed with the sand or the sediment up into a hose and they're supposed to put it on a barge and take it offshore where they're allowed to dispose of it safely where it won't harm any corals. But they were essentially leaking the sediment all over the place right on top of the reef area and that ended up burying and smothering the reef. And what leaked out was the really fine sediment. It was essentially like concrete powder getting poured all over the reef and, and the corals couldn't survive. What? kind of consequences or impact has the dredging had on the corals? It definitely cuts the light down and that harms corals because they need light and it also will just eventually bury them in sand, smother them. So corals have some ability to remove sand from themselves but they eventually get exhausted and then um, they, they start to get buried. When they're getting buried and they're exhausted from trying to remove sediments from themselves or to remove sand from themselves, um, then they are more likely to get diseases and studies have shown that. It becomes a problem when it is just raining down on the corals for weeks, months, and even up to a year, which is about how long the, um, we observed these turbidity plumes in the, in the Port of Miami dredging project. You never get back the reef that was lost, but you can do some restoration projects that will improve um, the reefs and help the reefs recover faster. For boaters and operators like Sailfish Scuba, there are ways to help the researchers battle climate change and disease on the front line. We have a program called Blue Star, and this is a program that partners the sanctuary with operators who do either diving and snorkeling trips or fishing guides. And so we have a Blue Star dive program and a Blue Star fishing guides program. These are operators who take tourists out onto the water, either to swim, snorkel, dive, or fish. 
And they, by being a part of this program, are committing to a higher standard of activities and educating their guests. How do you fish sustainably? How do you safely release a fish? You know, you catch it, it's exciting to catch it, but maybe you can release it. So they, they train and teach those kinds of practices. And then for the diving and snorkeling, how to make sure that people understand, don't touch the corals, they're not pretty rocks. Don't stand on the corals, et cetera, those kinds of things. Use coral safe sunscreen, they are alive, they are animals, and they're fragile. Blue Star operators, which we are one of them, uh, one of our goals is, it's like my briefing that yeah. I gave you all on the way out here, is mm -hmm. a Blue Star briefing. You know, don't touch things, don't, yeah. you know, if you, if you see something, don't go pick it up. Yeah. You know, let us make the determination mm -hmm. if it needs to be collected or not. What are some of the prevention practices that you do to help clean up the corals or take care of them? Yeah, if, if you see a plastic, bottom, yeah. point it out to us. Mm -hmm. If it's floating through the water, go ahead and collect it. Um, but if it's on the bottom, point it out to us. We can make a determination right there. If it's collectible, we'll collect it. If it's a bunch of line, like through a bunch of different corals, we'll mark it down, we'll come back, we'll actually do a cleanup on mm -hmm. that site. Because when you start taking line and fishing line and ropes out from coral. You have to be careful that you don't damage the coral, but you want to try to get yeah. it out so it doesn't starve its growth. It's like putting a rope around a tree. Yeah. You're eventually going to kill it. Florida National Marine Sanctuary has attempted to get a majority of the operators to be Blue Star operators and apply for it because one, it helps protect where I make my money at. Yeah. Uh, and the briefings they have a specific briefing that they use. Uh, we have to take a class every year. There is still hope. We are not past the point of no return. We are getting there. The economic costs of doing nothing far outweigh the economic costs of doing something now. As much as I like to think that I can make a difference, one person acting on their own isn't going to make a difference. We all have to act together. Um, so teach other people about why coral reefs are important. The more that you know, the more you can teach other people and educating other people is another one of the best things that you can do. Because a lot of people don't know. Like you can't protect and care about what you don't understand. So teaching other people is another great way you can help protect coral reefs. I would love for people who aren't necessarily coming here to lend their voices to helping to make sure that this place has the resources it needs to be protected and that we are working hard to address these threats to our reefs. Where do you see the future of coral going? Say in 2030 or 2050, um, is it more of an optimistic view? Or? Oh, I'm totally an optimist. I see the passion and commitment um, that surrounds me in this community. Um, people are really, really dedicated to trying to address these problems. I think we need to pay attention to the warning signs that we're getting right now from the seagrass die-offs, from the fish kills, from losing the reef and make some serious changes um, and make investments in our future. If, if we value having nature and living with nature, uh, we need to change the way that we interact with it. And so my true belief at this point in time is, is you know, things we feel like we've almost bottomed out, but I think we're turning things around. I really do truly think that we have, there's hope here. And I truly believe that in 2030, we can have flourishing reefs again. They may not look exactly the same because there may be certain species of corals that just aren't amenable to the conditions. But we know with those dominant reef building corals and some of these other species that, that we've seen, that there are certain genetic strains that can tolerate some of these stressors. And by getting those out there, I think that that is a fighting chance that we have. Yeah, the projects that we're working on, while important, are not the solution. We are buying time and we can keep putting corals out onto the reef we can keep putting thousands of corals every year, but unless conditions in the ocean improve, they're not going to thrive. And we're also improving our technology. Technology's gone, you know, a huge way forward in terms of being able to outplant more of these to scale up this whole effort. So I, I'm very optimistic. I think that that it's it's a matter of getting the word out, getting the, the public, the community engaged, and continuing to explore these, these approaches to enhance the resilience of these ecosystems. And we'll have coral reefs that are beautiful and flourishing and providing all the human services in 2030. My wish is that um, a young girl who's learning to snorkel or dive today, when she's my age, she's telling the opposite story. She's showing a picture of her snorkeling at Carey's Fort Reef when she was a little girl 
And then she's showing a picture of it when she's my age. And it's, it's the, the script has been flipped, right? That's, that's my goal. And I, I, that can happen. And there is a middle ground. We don't necessarily need to go back to a point where, you know, humans weren't around and we weren't polluting at all. But we do need to take a step back and get to a point where corals can thrive um, and humans can still live on the planet. Obviously, we're not going anywhere. So we need to find a way where we can coexist with the reefs and find a happy medium. This is an interactive aquarium out here. Yeah. You know, you can actually go in respectfully run around with it, you could see fish this close. Yeah. You know, whereas in an aquarium, you're looking through a glass, mm -hmm. you know, or in a museum, you're looking at corals. Oh yeah, that's a coral. But it's a lot different when you're one on one with it. It's really eye opening to see how the way we are living is directly impacting those very valuable and important ecosystems. We have to be aware of the impact and the damages that we are causing through dredging, through pollution, through excessive fossil fuel use. We have to innovate. There's no better time than now to work together and create solutions to these very serious problems that face us. The small little decisions we make on a daily basis of being aware of our impact and more sensitive to the environment. One of the biggest feelings or thoughts that I'm left with is the importance of the coral reef. We're here in Miami, Florida, with the Miami port just directly behind us, and we cannot ask for a better, more beautiful day to be out here visiting and experiencing Miami in its full. It's been truly inspiring to experience the livelihood and the ability of human beings building something as beautiful and as vibrant as Miami. And after seeing what we can do in Miami, I know that we could shift these gears and put some attention and focus on helping out another world that is also another part of us and this planet. See you on the next adventure.